welcome to the presentation of WIOS, democratizing how we access networks to a universal router and open source software. That's the topic for today. The speaker is Christian. He has more than 10 years of embedded software, mainly in Linux. And um, he is co-founder and mentor since year seven years in WIOS. And he has started with bug fixing. Um, at the moment, he is doing network architecture with the uh, focus on automatization. What we will hear today is um, WIOS is a free routing platform for competitors directly with other commercial available solutions from well-known networks providers. Because WIOS is running on a standard AD AMD 64 system, it can be used as a router and firewall platform to cloud development. This networks run on WIOS. So, your stage. Thank you, Vion, for the introduction. Hi. So, my name is Christian. Um, I give you a short overview of what we do, what we can do, what we maybe cannot do. Um, so, this talk is about the universal software router. It's an open source network operating system based on Debian. Currently, the current LTS version runs on Debian Bookworm. The previous LTS version runs Debian Buster. We operate or run on standard x86 systems. We have experimental ARM support maybe for the Raspberry Pi system. <coughs> Our minimum hardware requirements currently we lifted it from 512 megabytes of RAM to 1 gigabyte of RAM and 2 gigabyte of storage. Um, for the base system installation. It's an image-based system, so you just upgrade from one version to the next, and the configuration is copied. Um, we provide a powerful feature set for routing, firewalling, VPN services, and now also containerized applications. So I want to give you a short history recap where we come from. Um, so everything started in 2006 with a product or a software called Viada. Um, Viada, it's, it was, or it's a free software alternative to Cisco IOS, Juniper Junos, or any other commercial network operating system that you know of. Um, Viada was available in two different versions. Viada Core, which was an open source or community-driven version, which was completely free software, and the subscription version containing proprietary features like data plane acceleration which would now be done by using VPP. Um, and it was available only to paying customers. Viada was acquired by Brocade in 2012. Shortly after that, Brocade renamed it to Brocade vRouter. It discontinued Viada Core, and it shut down the Git repositories containing the source code, the, uh, the public available bug tracker, and everything that was known to the public. Fun fact, the person of you utilizing Ubiquity equipment. Um, so Ubiquiti Edge OS is actually also a fork from Viada, just from a previous or from a different version of the base system. So our key features that we can offer or that Vios as a system offers, so we, we support dynamic routing like BGP, OSPF, OSPF version 3 for IPv6, ISIS, and most recently also MPLS support was added. BGP has additional options or support. We support BGP flow spec route, uh, routes, labeled unicast routes, multicast routes, unicast, of course, VPN and also uh, L2 VPN, eVPN routes. All those address families given are valid for both IPv4 and IPv6. The currently now being released LTS version shifted from IP tables to NF tables. So our firewall is based on NF tables and contract. We support, as VPN protocols, we support IPsec, VP, OpenVPN, L2TP, L2TP version 3, SSTP. So for those who are not familiar with SSTP, it was originally developed by Microsoft. It's the secure socket tunneling protocol. It's a VPN that runs through HTTPS. So it's... Its usage is mostly in countries that have a very strict internet access policy, even, even within the country itself. So it's used within such countries to establish secure VPN connect, connections between multiple sites, as you can't really look into HTTPS traffic yet. 
And of course, we support the famous WireGuard VPN protocol. Quality of service features like the just regular Linux traffic classifier for bandwidth management and traffic prioritization. We have now backported also in the previous LTS version container support. We are utilizing Portman for it as it's a one-to-one -one drop and replacement for Docker. And you can run any OCI image on, a, on our BIOS router. An example would be on my home system, I actually run a Unify controller for my Wi-Fi on my BIOS router. It's kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> we also have first up redundancy protocols like VRP. Um, we utilize KeepAlifeD for this. And recently, we added also VRF, which is the acronym for virtual routing and forwarding. So what you have on a layer 2 network, which is a VLAN, would be a VRF on the layer 3 networking. And of course, load balancing support for WAN, so multi aggregating multiple wide area network links, but also load balancing in terms of HTTPS traffic, like um, a reverse proxy, which is utilized using NGINX. Um, from the architecture standpoint, you see on the bottom, we run on, on any current, um, we run on x86 hardware, any hypervisor, be it Proxmox, ESXi, XCPNG, Azure Stack, Google, Google, the Google Cloud Stack. We then have a recent Linux kernel. The current LTS version runs on 6.6.23, .6 so which is the latest bug fix version of the stable branch. On top, we have all the open source libraries or daemons that we consume, like FRR for routing, StrongSwan for VPN, OpenVPN, XLPPP, which is our implementation for L2TP and also for as a PPP OE server. And on top, we have this configuration layer. And what's key on VIOS is that you have a structured CLI layer where you configure all your systems. You do not need to know the specific syntax of all those open source products that we utilize. Like you don't need to know the specific FRR syntax. You don't need to know the specific strong swan syntax. You also don't need to know the sp uh, specific PPPoE server syntax. Everything is abstracted, abstracted using our CLI. So you have a unified look and feel for all those different product or demons that we ship. On top of this configuration layer, there is the CLI. And of course, we now provide an HTTPS API to interact with the system, changing the configuration. Today, I learned from the NOC that they are using the HTTPS API to push firewall rules into the system automatically. Between kernel and our CLI, we have to honor and name a lot of different open source products. It's, we don't uh, not everything is listed here. But as you see, you see the key players like free range routing, which goes, uh, gives us the routing engine, StrongSwan for IPsec, OpenVPN, WireGuard, Debian is our base system. We still use ISC DHCP for the LTS version. The latest current and rolling version already migrated to Kia as DHCP server. We have PowerDNS as, Power as Recursor as our recursing DNS server. And of course, we also ship some legacy stuff like a Squid Web Proxy. The idea behind is that we try to reuse over and not rebuild or reinvent the wheel again. So we consume open source products and abstract them using our CLI. We try to re-upstream patches if they are accepted and if it's possible. Not every patch is accepted, but at least the FRR team is happily accepting patches from us. Um, you have a brilliant idea, talk to us maybe convince us if it's a bit a skeptical idea. And we try to make the system stronger. You find something that super sucks, tell us, and we try to make it better. So it's all about democracy. You can build your own ISO image from the LTS repository on yourself using those three simple commands. We provide a Docker daemon or a Docker build Docker-based build environment. You just need to execute it, clone our source, and then run this pseudo line for, build, for building the ISO image. You will get the current 
rolling image or in this case with the Sajita branch on top, you will get an ISO image of the current LTS or the future LTS version. So it's quite simple to produce your own binaries. So I want to give you a brief, also a brief overview how to get started with this system. So you can get the latest rolling release from our website or you build it, from, uh, build it on your own. You just boot the installation ISO image. It is a Debian Live system using the default credentials BIOS BIOS, and then you just run the install image command. It will format your hard disks, asks you if you want to set up RAID 1 or software RAID 1 if you have multiple devices, and you reboot into your fresh system. It also asks you if you want to change the default credentials. So once we've rebooted into our new system, we have to talk about, or we have to define some terminology. So we have the active configuration of the router, which is the configuration that is currently loaded and applied to all underlying daemons. We have the working configuration, so when you plan to change something, you enter the configuration mode and apply your changes. As long as you don't commit those changes, so you have a configuration system. As long as you don't commit those changes, it, they won't be applied. Like there are other routers, uh, router operating systems where you enter a command and it is immediately active. So it's sometimes quite dangerous. You can log out yourself quite easily. Here you have to commit your changes. We also have a commit confirm. When you do not confirm your commit, the system will reboot automatically after 10 minutes. So if you shoot yourself in the knee, you, ju you just have to wait 10 minutes and then it will get back up with the old configuration. We also have the saved configuration, which is the representation of the active configuration that is saved to, the, to your disk. It's, an, it's, a text it's a text file. You can open it with any editor. You can also change contents in it. And that's the file that is loaded after a system reboot. So now that we have logged into the system and booted our installed media, we have two, op two different modes. We have the so-called operational mode. We just check this, the health status of the system. What are my configured interfaces? Uh, how many hits do I get on firewall uh, rules? Um, I need to restart a DHCP client on the system. So that's what you see with when you get this kind of shell. As soon as you enter configure, you enter the configura configuration mode where you can change things on your system. You can also break things on your system. So as already mentioned, we have the, uh, the text-based configuration file, which also allows easy templating or support for easy template creation, as it's just a text file that needs to be rendered. It also has a very big benefit. You can just copy the configuration from system A to system B and to have a full backup or a full replica of your system. I already mentioned the commit confirm method that you can reboot the system or the system reboots automatically if you do not issue the confirm command. So likewise, you lock yourself out of the system. And of course, we have built-in version, built-in config versioning, meaning every, every time you change something on the system, we create a new version of the configuration file in the back end. So the saved configuration file won't be al altered. It will always, or the saved configuration will be altered. It always contains the latest version. But we save the previous versions also on disk. There is a compare command where you can see what changed. So you can roll back to older configurations, and you can also diff what changed between two configuration versions. So when you look at the configuration, so when we are in configuration mode, you, we have some well-known commands like show, set, delete, renew. Those commands you all get, you have a built-in bash completion, just using the, the question mark key or tap tap as completion helper, you will get, get a list of all supported features. To show the current configuration of your ind of to show the current system configuration, you just issue show configuration, and it will list you the current active configuration. In this case, it's just a brief excerpt of the uh, configuration of interface ETH zero. 
There is also, when you alter the configuration on the system, you use the set command. So set interfaces, Ethernet, ETH0 address. And then you either enter DHCP if you want to have a DHCP interface, or you just enter the IP address of the static IP address of that interface. So it's just a different style of how to interact with the system. If you change something, you need to use the set commands. If you would just want to display the configuration, you use show, and you have an indented replication or an indented version of the configuration shown to you. So changes to the working configuration is done using set, as I already mentioned. You can also use edit to get an inline editor to change nodes. You remove configurations using the delete keyword. So in the first example, I set, I set two static IP addresses, one IPv4, one IPv6 address. And on the next um, step, I delete the DHCP assignment of the particular interface. You can, of course, or you can, you do not need to always exit from configuration mode to run commands in operational mode. You just can prefix your operational mode commands using the run keyword, which saves you just the context switch between operational mode and configuration mode. So in this example, I just use the show, con show interfaces command from operational mode, but I'm running in configuration mode. The already men uh, mentioned configuration management. So we, with using show system commit, we see when the configuration of the system was altered and by, who it wa by whom it was altered. So we have three changes to the configuration applied by root using the bootloader. So the system was rebooted and the configuration was applied to the system. And we have two changes to the system done by the user account virus. You can compare between version 0, version 4, between version 2 and version 3, or between version 3 and version 2, always depending on which direction you want to go. And in addition, there is something called a commit archive, which, can't, which is not only local, but you can also install a commit archive on a remote location. So you can, every time you, inter, you enter the commit command, the configuration will always be uploaded to either an SCP location, a TFTP location, an FTP location, or most recently to an HTTPS, HTTPS Git location. So you just push to a remote Git repository. So some real-world use cases for us or that I want to show, demonstrate you. Um, I'm using virus for hybrid Cloud Connect systems to connect an on-premise data center to the Azure Cloud using an IPsec tunnel and exchanging routes using BGP with the regular Azure uh, VPN gateway. Um, our nonprofit organization AS12817 uses virus as a BGP upstream router. So we announce our public IP space, IPv4 and IPv6, to private peerings in Frankfurt and also retrieve our um, internet upstream using those virtual machines. That one runs on Proxmox. We also transport a 1,500-byte MTU over VPN link using WireGuard. So for those of you who connect several sites via VPN, be it IPsec or OpenVPN, you always, one day you always see that you have problems or connectivity issues or it's super slow and you notice, oh, there is an MTU problem or you forget to install TCP MSS clamping. With WireGuard, you have the opportunity that you can lift the MTU within the tunnel to 1,500 bytes from the default. WireGuard itself will then do the fragmentation below, but your overlay protocol that you send through the tunnel just uses the plain good old Ethernet 1,500 bytes MTU size. I learned that and I loved it. Um, we also support uh, DMVPN. DMVPN was a technology from Cisco quite old. Um, it's a hub-and-spoke VPN system utilizing IPsec. It's, you can run it with a Cisco hub or a Cisco spoke and a virus hub, so it's completely um, independent of the vendor. It establishes dynamic VPN tunnels between spoke sites. So in a VP 
So regular VPNs always have a hub side, and when two spokes need to communicate, usually the traffic flows through the hub if they are not set up in a full mesh scenario. When you are on systems with, with dynamic IP assignment, like in Germany, uh, uh, regular good old PPPoE sessions with dynamic IPs, DMVPN uses an, a protocol called NHRP, Next Hub Resolution Protocol. It's like ARP on layer three, and it queries the current public IP address of the remote side, and then establishes a dynamic VPN tunnel between the spokes to form a full mesh topology on demand. Um, I also use IKE, uh, IKE version 2 Road Warrior support, which is shipped with StrongSwan. So it's the de facto standard IPsec client, which is built into every operating system, being it iOS, Windows, Linux, you name it, just to establish my secure connections. And also you can run it on Proxmox with the Proxmox SDN controller that was recently added or available for, for, yeah, for quite some time. Proxmox SDN supports spanning layer three and layer two networks across multiple nodes. And you can connect those nodes to a virus router to also support or sh sh send into a full DG BGP default routing table into the Proxmox eVPN overlay. And of course, my home router uses virus to run IPv6 and prefix delegation. Okay, so the project itself, it has a very active community. It moved from IRC to Slack, like a lot of other projects. Um, there are a lot of users, uh, users helping users um, and contributors. We have very short development cycles for bug fixes. That we was the feedback that we received from not only customers, but also from the community. We have a forum, we have a bug tracker, we have the Slack, already mentioned Slack channel, and we have a documentation running on Read the Docs. Um, we have a blog informing you about current internal changes, development, activity within the project, or also new real world use cases. And of course, we accept PRs, and we heavily rely on them. Okay, we are very good in time, so I can show you a nice example what you can do with wires. So we have so this is one of my, my recent or yeah recent blog articles. We have a wires network forming a so called the FUBAR service provider. So it has service provider edge nodes, it's PE provider edge nodes, which are interconnected, and we have three customer sites. We have site two, we have site one, and we have site three. We have three tenants, three clients. Those tenants are called blue, green, and red. And they require different types of services. So they can, ha they can require layer two connectivity between site one and site two. They can require layer three connectivity between site one and site two, or between all sites. In this example, Everything inside the provider network uses eVPN, Ethernet VPN. It is a control plane where you advertise MAC addresses using BGP. So it's an extension to the B BGP protocol. The, the PE routers know to w which node I need to send my traffic that I receive if I want to reach at, uh, a specific MAC address or an IP address when I want to talk to layer three devices. On the edge node, I just have a connection to my client network, ETA1, ETH6, with an IP address interface. And those three tenants are isolated from each other. So the blue tenant cannot talk to the red tenant or the green tenant. So everything is isolated on layer two and isolated on layer three. The payload sent from, in our example, sent from site two to site three it traverses to the provider edge equipment. So it's a regular Ethernet port on the provider edge. It will be encapsulated on the provider edge into a VXLAN packet and then sent through to the destination VTAP 
is the virtual tunnel endpoint of the, uh, of the VXLAN interface where my target system resides, being at layer 2 or layer 3. When looking at it from a packet capture, you see our regular layer 2 frame with our regular layer 2 MAC address. Then we see the packet is encapsulated into IPv4. It's a UDP packet running on port 4789. It's the IANA assigned default VXLAN port. And inside the VXLAN packet, we have a so-called virtual extensible local area network. It's the VNI or the virtual network identifier. So when you remember VLANs on layer 2, which are only 12 bits, you can have up to 4,095 VLANs. You need to subtract some VLANs that the router itself needs for layer 3 interfaces, but you are limited by that number. Using VXLAN and VNIs, you can transport up to 16 million such private layer 2 or layer 3 interconnects. VXLAN packets add a 50-byte overhead to your, underlying, uh, to your underlying IPv4 packet, so you need to account for that. No problem, if you use WireGuard as an, uh, as an underlay, you can pack everything together. And inside the VXLAN VNI identifier, which is here 2000, which identifies, I think it is the blue tenant. You see, again, there is a layer 2 packet inside with a layer 2 MAC address. And then again, the layer 3 packet used for ping. So that was a short example of what we can achieve with the current state of BIOS, that you can interconnect multiple sites using layer 2 and layer 3 networks. Okay, I was quite fast with my presentation. Um, so I have just one remaining slide. Um, guess which open source network operating system is used to connect this Congress to the internet? There's only one valid answer. No. <laughs> so BIOS is actually used to connect Easter hack to the internet. And a week before, the, um, before this event, we did some bug fixing on the Intel drivers with the NOC, because not all SFPs were supported in the beginning. So that's for fast bug fixing. Yeah, um, that's a QR code to my GitHub page if you want to reach out to me. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Now you can ask some questions if you want or not. No one? Okay. So I think no one wants to ask you something. Everything is clear? Oh, I think there is someone. Hi, um, one question. Uh, do you support or plan to support um, LRCP multi-homing active-active mode that is supported in FAIR? It's already inside the CLI, so okay. it's available, but it's on my to-do list to write a blog post about it, how to support EVP and active-active multi-homing user wires. Thanks. For, for those who don't know what it is, so when you... So on a regular router, you can form a so-called bond of, or LSCP link between two, uh, two physical interfaces connecting to the same destination system. But for redundancy reasons, it would be very good to connect it to different systems that one of those systems can always go into maintenance mode. So there is a proprietary feature from a lot of vendors called MLAC, multi-chassis link aggregation, and EVPN active-active multi-homing is the RFC-compliant way to support link aggregation across multiple devices in a standard way, using EVPN as the underlying control plane. So it's there. Please test it and feedback. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, someone else have a question?
Okay, thank you.